Good morning everybody, my name is Alex, and before I begin, I don't want to give off the wrong impression here. I don't want to be so presumptuous as to suggest that some kid without a qualification to his name somehow knows better than a professor of philosophy with 20 years of experience under his belt. However, I recently came across a video of one such individual to which, as if by reflex, I developed a number of objections. And so, whilst I'm probably not going to be able to play the entire video for time's sake, I would like to offer my humble response, and of course a link to the full video will be available in the description, and I'd be happy to further discuss any parts that I may leave out of this response. I'm Len Goodman. I am a philosopher. Uh, I have uh, uh, an appointment at Vanderbilt University where I've taught for the past 20 years, and for 25 years before that I taught philosophy at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. Uh, I'm very interested in Jewish philosophy and in Islamic philosophy and uh, sometimes I tell people that in Islamic philosophy I'm an interpreter. Uh, in Jewish philosophy I'm an interpreter also but also a player. First of all I would say that the worry that uh, science and religion are in competition with each other is a misplaced fear. If you're speaking abstractly, then I'd say I agree, but only because science doesn't at all care for claims that are unfalsifiable, like the existence of gods, for example. If, however, you make certain specific religious claims that contradict demonstrable reality, well, then I'm afraid there is a conflict between religion and science. If your religion states that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old, for instance, then it unambiguously contradicts science. The same goes for if it claims that humans did not evolve, or that Jesus turned water into wine, or that Muhammad split the moon in two, or that Moses parted the Red Sea. Now, I'm obviously not accusing you personally of holding any of these beliefs, but it would be foolish not to recognize that they do exist and are prominent amongst religious communities. But it's not just these types of religious claims that contrast scientific reality anyway. Some historical accounts given in the Bible do this too. We can conclusively say, for instance, that Noah's Ark and the flood it was supposedly built for did not exist, despite Jesus referring to these as historical entities. More salient still, there is absolutely no evidence to support the story of the Jewish exodus from Egypt, or even that the Israelites were enslaved there in the first place. Even deeply religious archaeologists with a vested interest to uncover evidence that supports the scriptural narrative have repeatedly had to admit defeat, which actually makes their findings, or lack thereof, all the more significant and trustworthy. Here's Christopher Hitchens on page 102 of God is Not Great. But then much more extensive and objective work was undertaken, presented most notably by Israel Finkelstein of the Institute of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University and his colleague Neil Asher Silberman. These men regard the Hebrew Bible, or Pentateuch, as beautiful, and the story of modern Israel as an all-around inspiration, in which respects I humbly beg to differ. But their conclusion is final, and the more creditable for having asserted evidence over self-interest. There was no flight from Egypt, no wandering in the desert, let alone for the incredible four-decade length of time mentioned in the Pentateuch, and no dramatic conquest of the Promised Land. It was all, quite simply and very ineptly, made up at a much later date. So depending on the claim and depending on the religion, I can certainly find at least a handful of instances that flatly contradict that which you've just asserted. But I also feel this point you're making actually misrepresents the problem that many advocates of science have with religion. It's not so much the conclusions presented by religion that are the problem, it's the means by which these conclusions were achieved. You see, it's faith that is the problem here something that all religions are at least somewhat reliant upon. Faith, by definition, requires belief in something without any proof that supports that something. Science, conversely, is the antithesis of this, a method of learning what is true through nothing less than reliable and repeatable proof. Religious views are rooted in faith, and I think that even the most talented of religious apologists would struggle to convince any thinking person that the scientific method and faith are at all reconcilable. Uh... Uh, it's, it could be an excuse for uh, setting religion aside. Uh, people don't like to be told what to do, and uh, religions often uh, do like to try and set values and goals and limits and aspirations for us. You seem to have this almost exactly wrong. It's not that we don't want to be religious, therefore we say it contradicts science. It's that it contradicts science, therefore we don't want to be religious. I mean, you are right, I don't want to be owned, I don't want to be a pawn in some cosmic game of chess, but more importantly, I don't want to believe in any god whose existence is unsupported by empirical evidence, and certainly not one whose existence is positively disproven by it. 
Moreover, I know many people, such as American atheist president David Silverman, who actually do want to believe in God, but can't, because the evidence doesn't point that way. It's nothing to do with having moral objections to the existence of God, although believe me, I could find some. Uh, but uh, uh, if, one, if one studies science, and studies science carefully, and studies the world as our book... I think you may be thinking about science in the wrong way, which might actually explain the problem here. Science is not some set of beliefs or conclusions, but a method of obtaining them. Religious views wouldn't be at all controversial if only they could be reliably verified. But don't take my word for it. Here's Dr. Lawrence Krauss. I think the point is, first of all, we, we, part of it re resides in the fact that we teach science the wrong way. We teach it as an accumulation of facts. It isn't. It's a process for deriving facts. And so what I advise those people to do is to learn the process of science and teachers to teach the process of science. Skeptical questioning, reliance on empirical evidence, testing, further testing, multiple sources. That's the way science progresses. And it's the way we need in our society right now to address the global challenges of the world. When politicians say something, demand empirical evidence. And of course, it goes without saying that the same applies to religious authorities as well as politicians. If you're going to make any claim that has far-reaching consequences in both my private life and the society that I live in, I will, every time, unapologetically demand your evidence. Uh, one finds all kinds of um, evidence. Well, what do you know? We may be in luck, then. Of uh, divine action, uh, divine creativity, uh, uh, the beauty of the world. Uh. Okay, I'm sure most of the people watching this video are already aware that it's our sense of beauty that has adapted to the world, not the other way around. But I do have to ask, if the world was very ugly and we couldn't stand the sight of nature, would that at all affect your belief in an intelligent designer? You may say that you think the universe needs a designer, as William Paley said, a watch needs a watchmaker. But if I see a watch that is wholly ugly and unattractive, it would in no way lessen my belief in the existence of its maker. And if you're going to grant God the credit for all the beauty in the world, then you also have to account, let's not forget, for all the countless repugnant horrors that exist within it too. Uh, the, uh, the rationality of the world, the intelligibility of the world. If there is one thing that has prevented humanity from turning the world into something that is intelligible through the use of open inquiry and scientific investigation, and instead has tried to preserve its mysteries in order to retain the ability to attribute otherwise easily understandable phenomena to some being other than Mother Nature, it's religion. Uh, these are the things that scientists look at. Uh, they're better at looking at the intelligibility than they are at the, the beauty. They see it, but they don't have methods by which they can measure it. Um, this is an area where a religion might be helpful to science. I oh, know, we, we really don't need your help, thanks. We know very well why certain things are attractive to humans and some aren't. Haven't you ever considered what a coincidence it is that those things that look and feel good are generally things that benefit our survival, and those that look and feel bad tend to be things that inhibit it? Why does the thought of eating mud, even when we're hungry, still repel us? I don't think this needs spelling out. It's because those who didn't feel this way would have tried to eat it and promptly died because of it. Conversely, I don't think that there are many things more attractive than a glass of water on a hot, dehydrated day, and what luck, this is also majorly beneficial to our survival. It's almost as though there is some process of selection which is natural that governs human evolution. Somebody should write that down. Uh, but uh, uh, the idea that there's an explanatory zero-sum game so that the more uh, science can explain the less is left for religion to talk about uh, I, I think is a misplaced anxiety. Well, I'm afraid that it is true that religion does have less to talk about than it did a few centuries ago, say, thanks to science. You don't, for instance, hear many people these days discussing the angels who were once thought to hold the planets in their orbits around the Earth that sits in the center of the universe, but I think I still grasp the essence of what you're trying to say. And in fact, you may be quite right in that even once science can fully cover the how of any phenomenon, it can seldom cover the why. Unfortunately, whilst we can be sure that there is always a how to be uncovered, it may just be the case that why is a nonsense question, and that there simply is no why. Any question surely needs to be justified before it's deserving of an answer. Uh, some of the medieval philosophers that I study um, who were very committed to the idea that God created the world, um, 
thought that that couldn't be proved. Uh, had they known of the evidence for the Big Bang, uh, they would have been terribly excited. Had they known that the evidence for uh, an expanding universe uh, uh, provided the possibility and increasingly uh, confirmed the notion uh, that the world had an origin, they would have thought they were home free because it couldn't have originated itself. Yes, because that's not an assumption at all, is it? Look, I've covered this before. The Big Bang Theory certainly has lent a helping hand to theologians who subscribe to arguments from causation, but such thinkers are still a long way off from proving their proposed conclusions. There's nothing to say that the Big Bang was the beginning of everything, only the beginning of everything we know of. Furthermore, cause and effect are reliant on time in order for one to precede the other. Outside of the universe, there is no time, and so causality breaks down. The concept of a cause as we know it might not even be possible to apply. If you're interested, I gave an entire speech on whether or not the universe needs a cause in July, which you can find in the description. Uh, I know you've worked on this uh, issue yourself as a, a serious physicist, and, um, and that's, that's something that religious people today uh, should find very inspiring. Uh, certainly, any of the great medieval philosophers who defended the idea of creation would have thought science is on our side. Wrong. Science is on nobody's side. The fruits of scientific history are simply facts of nature. The question is, are you on the side of reality? Um, I think that evolution shows the same thing. Unless, of course, you believe, as all three Abrahamic religions do, that humans are God's chosen species, that humans are superior to all other animals and are so because of God's will. Because if so, you have to explain exactly when this initiated. Okay, no human was ever born to a different type of ape. There was no first human, so to speak. Evolution is a gradual process. Richard Dawkins once compared it to the fact that you don't go to sleep middle-aged one night and wake up elderly the next day. There's no definitive cutoff point. The same goes for the emergence of Homo sapiens. There is no single point when the species arrived on Earth. Now, assuming that our ancient apish ancestors and other human species were not themselves the beneficiaries of God's principal focus, at what point along the evolutionary timeline did God decide that humanity had sufficiently evolved to adopt this privilege? It's very difficult to accept that we humans are a tiny speck in the unimaginably vast process of evolution on Earth, and yet also claim that we are the most important factor in all of creation. Arrogant, you might even say. Uh, science vindicates uh, uh, religious ideas in some very significant ways. Yes, and it also devastates some other religious ideas in equally significant ways, and with a proportionality that resembles chance guesswork. Faith, if it is ever right about anything, said Sam Harris, is right by accident. Unfortunately, polemicists, uh, uh, both, both religious fundamentalists and um, scientific fundamentalists. Fundamentalism requires an ideology. Science is not an ideology. Once again, it's a method. Also, to paraphrase Sam Harris again, the only problem with religious fundamentalism is the fundamentals of religion. Have um, jumped on an idea like evolution and uh, come up with the notion that evolution and religion are in conflict with one another. On the contrary, uh, evolution is is evidence for the reality of, of divine action as I see it because, because uh, uh, nature doesn't just sit around, uh, it, it, uh, it, it springs to life and, it, and, 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 and beings aspire and try to, to persist and to be more uh, than they have been. The mere fact that human beings need to persist at all in order to simply survive should surely give any theist pause for thought, but Aside from that, you haven't actually given any reason why evolution in any way vindicates religious claims. In fact, you seem to be rambling. Let me take a different example of a point that tries to disprove God and present it using the same phrasing that you just used to show you just how little you're actually saying. Imagine if I said, some people claim that God is compatible with evil, but on the contrary, evil is dependent on divine action as I see it because evil doesn't just sit around, it, it, it springs to life, it continually aspires to be more destructive than it was. What does this actually mean? There is literally no substance in the words I'm saying.
Perhaps I just missed the point, but I, I have to say I'm unimpressed. Similarly with brain science, uh, I think there's a popular illusion around that, uh, that, that, that the more we know about the brain, the less uh, able we are to talk about human persons as something other than the bodies in which the self originates. I think on the contrary, uh, if, one, if one reads the literature, uh, the smart money in, uh, in brain science, and I'm thinking of people like Evan Thompson and, and uh, many, many others, uh, they're holistic about the work of the brain. They're looking at the integrative character of the brain. One cannot reduce the self to the organ and the system of organs that makes a self and a person possible. And that's why I have made my effort to uh, make the word soul respectable again, not as something that flits about and, and floats through walls, but, but as something that can be creative and thoughtful and aware and perceptive and loving and caring. Uh, uh, brain science is telling us more and more that, uh, that, that, that the integration of body and soul is the way human beings actually uh, come together and work and live their lives. Here's a direct quote from the one name you mentioned, Evan Thompson. My view is that the brain and the body work together in the context of our physical environment to create a sense of self. Where exactly do you propose the soul fits into this? I considered omitting the latter half of this response due to the fact that I don't feel that the original video really says anything at all, but I can't exactly criticise you for it because you're not, after all, an evolutionary biologist or a neuroscientist. But then again, neither am I. And if you're going to talk about any topic, whether it's your speciality or not, you should be willing to defend the assertions you make. So all I'll say on the proposal you just made about the integration of the body and soul is that if you want to argue that this needs to happen, the existence of both parts to be integrated have to be proven first. Prove to me that I have a soul, in other words, and then we can begin to talk about its significance. Until then, I've been Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic. You can find me on social media here. I want to thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.